winter lecture series. Uh, this evening's lecture is the role of local authorities in addressing climate action and biodiversity. Our speaker this evening is Michal Lyons, uh, who has a master's in science, an MBA, has a bachelor of technology, is a chartered engineer with Engineers Ireland, and a member of the Chartered Institute of uh, Building Services Engineer. Michal is the manager of the Climate Action Unit in Cork City Council. He began his climate action journey with the Energy Conservation Support Unit of the United Kingdom's Building Research Establishment, working on that body's innovative domestic energy modelling initiative, which became the precursor to the building energy rating system. He became the manager of Cork City Council's energy agency in, in the year 2000 and was instrumental in the development of the Lifetime Lab initiative on the Lee Road. Michal is a past chairperson of the Association of Irish Energy Agencies. He is one of the founding directors of the Irish Solar Energy Association and is currently a member of the Atlantic Seaboard South Climate Action Region, South Climate Action Regional Office or CARO steering group. Michal coordinated the development of Cork City Council's Climate Change Adaptation Strategy 2019 to 24 to 2024 and currently monitors the associated implementation of the adopted actions. So would you please uh, give a warm welcome as best you can to uh, Mr. Michal Lines, who's going to present to us this evening on the role of local authorities in addressing climate action and biodiversity. Michal. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thank you very much for that warm introduction. Uh, can I just get an indication from somebody that uh, you can actually hear me and see me? We can indeed. Okay, that's good. I'd hate to be talking away there and nobody uh, uh, um, being able to hear me. Um, what we'll do is we will um, go through the slide deck that I prepared for this in about 30 or 35 minutes. And we have an opportunity uh, at the end of what may be a long working day for a lot of people uh, for some questions and answers. Um, my Understanding is that this may be recorded as well, and I'll certainly be able to supply some version of the slide deck to Engineers Ireland afterwards for, for uh, people uh, to look at it in greater detail. So the title is The Role of Local Authorities in Addressing Climate Action and Biodiversity. Um, I'm working in what we call the Climate Action Unit here in Cork City Council. And um, I suppose my main role is to help drive the climate adaptation and mitigation actions on behalf of the local authority. Mission that we have been given ourselves is to deliver, and this is for the sector now, the local authority sector, is to deliver transformative and measurable impact and climate action within our organization and across our cities and counties. And this will become apparent throughout the uh, talk that while it's very easy for us to do within our own organization, the harder one is to deliver it across our cities, our counties, and deliver it with and for our citizens. At the moment, unfortunately, we're dealing with a serious crisis at the moment, and, and um, it is playing havoc with uh, the way we work, rest, and play. However, the climate change has not gone away, so we just need to keep that in the back of our minds. I've got three children, three girls, three daughters, 11, 13 and 15 years of age, and we often stumble upon and say yes to the dress and things like that. And They were asking me recently, what does that phrase mean? Something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, and of course I've tried to explain that to them. I'm just trying to use that in, in, in the slide here. We're seeing the after the last week, we're seeing the exit of um, President Trump, and there we see Greta Thunberg. Uh, she would be, I, I would consider her one of the great leaders of the world at the moment. Something borrowed, something blue, this is our planet. And there's the whole idea that um, we should leave this planet in a better place or actually not leave it in a worse place than in which we found it. This goes to anybody who's a fan of uh, rugby will uh, know the All Blacks and, and they have a, a 15 point plan on how to be the best team they can be. And they, they always say that the jersey isn't actually owned by the person that wears the jersey on the pitch. 
they just borrowed it. One of the great mantras they have is to leave the jersey in a better place. There's another expression that some of you may have heard, which is plant trees you will never see. So the idea is that we all have a role to play in this. And uh, it's not just for ourselves, but it's for future generations as well. A lot of you will probably have seen this already. I won't dwell too long on it. These are the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. They're all intertwined and related to each other. But the ones that I'm particularly interested in are the ones at the bottom there that I've highlighted. So you have number 13, number 14, number 15. And then one that a lot of people don't um, sort of register with a lot of the time, but it's called Partnerships for the Goals. There's many different ways of looking at the um, SDGs. And here's one that I like, mainly because it has divided into three different sort of layers, shall we call it. The top one is economy. The second one down is society. And the third one, and which I would suggest is the, is the foundation for all of the ones above, so they operate correctly, is what they call the biosphere. And again, I have highlighted numbers uh, 15, 14, and 13 as being the ones which are extremely important for the good health of the ones above them. So they were life on land, life below water, climate action. And it's kind of like, an, I suppose, an analogy for an orchestra. There's different musicians here playing different instruments at different times, but if we can do it properly, we will get a coherent sound. Now, coming down from that, in the next um, sort of level down, we have the recently um, announced European Green Deal. And I do believe that the European Union are very progressive in terms of what we are trying to do to solve the climate and biodiversity crises that we're um, currently um, in the middle of. And if you look at these, I ringed a few of them and Somebody said to me once, you know, you could make it very, very simple by a few things that we might do, such as get out of your car and the airplane, reduce fossil fuel usage, increase renewable energy sources, and eat less meat. Now, I hope that doesn't um, upset too many people, but I think it is, it, it's a well-known fact that, um, you know, animals and the way we farm is probably not sustainable. Now, what I'm trying to do here is to show that, in my example, Cork City Council in green around the middle there, these are the various sort of frameworks that we operate and legislation that we operate to and under. So we've already talked about the United Nations SDGs and the European Green Deal. We currently have going through the houses of, our, of the Oireachtas Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Amendment Bill 2020. And that will actually, with the red arrow I've shown there, that will actually um, make all the local authorities bring out a local climate action plan. And I'd say that will be happening uh, next year at some stage. Just to remind you that the Regional Spatial and Economic Strategy has been brought out by the, um, the regions and we have in the last year and a half had the, uh, the development of the Climate Action Regional Offices, otherwise known as the CARO. There's four of those in the country. The one that uh, we work to here in Cork City Council is the Southern Atlantic region. We have developed a climate change adaptation strategy as in Cork City Council. And indeed, every local authority has developed one of these. Um, we are doing a new city development plan at the moment and I'm hoping that we will build, I'm sure we will build in a lot, which will help us uh, with climate adaptation and mitigation into the future. Now this isn't very, it's a busy slide, uh, but what I'm, trying to what I'm trying to show is that this is about collaboration across all of the sectors. So if I try and use this Zoom function here, just to give you an idea that there I've highlighted where Energy Ireland, for example, are put this iteration of the diagram. Um, we've got the LGMA, 
we've got the AFA, we've got the EPA, the IDA, and it goes on and goes on. And there are so many players and actors, and as there should be, because this is everybody's um, responsibility and everyone is almost involved at every stage in everything. Just to give, I'm not entirely sure with the audience how many people are in the local authority sector to actually work for, for, for councils or are aware of the sort of work that we do in general, but we have a certain reach and um, we are not central government, we're not a government agency. So there are certain areas where we focus upon and where we will be focusing upon in the future. And I would suggest that on the bottom of this particular diagram, looking at behavioral change in education and supporting community action are some of the areas that I will certainly be working very closely in. Now, this is not to say that we don't do other things like um, flood defenses, um, our roads, all the other work that we do, the harder engineering type work that local authorities do. What I'll be looking at for a, in a little bit more detail will be the behavioral change and community action like the public participation networks. I was talking to the LGMA, that's the kind of governing body for local authority uh, local authorities, and they have developed a local authority services catalog. So that's kind of like the Bible. This is what we have to do. What they're calling public facing services, not stuff that we do inside in our own organization, but stuff that we do for the general public. We have almost 1100 different actions or services that we have to provide and that we do provide. And that'll just give you an idea there. They've, we've kind of broken them down there in this diagram into um, sort of service areas. And if I can just look at environment, veterinary and cemeteries, of which there's about 174 distinct services. Inside in there, I have highlighted a few of the ones that are involved with climate action. It gets three memorable mentions here but what we're trying to do at the moment is we're trying to mainstream all of the actions that we do in the local authority in terms of climate action, or at least to make sure that they will not, um, they will not create any problems down the road in terms of mitigation or adaptation. There's a word that a lot of people use now recently and it's called existential. And um, they talk about existential threats. And the language here is very important. Some people might call it an environmental crisis. Some people might call it an environmental catastrophe. But back in the 1950s, I think, um, the existential threat of the time was MAD. In other words, it was called Mutually Assured Destruction, MAD. And that was about the bomb. And if anybody looks back on the old clips of duck and cover in schools in the United States of America, where when a siren went off, everybody ducked and covered and went under their school desk in the hope that that might save them uh, from some sort of uh, a, a, a nuclear holocaust. What we have now at the moment is, I would suggest, a different type of existential threat. And almost using the same diagram, but what we have here is instead of bombs raining down with carbon dioxide and um, methane going up. In our city here in Cork, or this, the local authority that I work for, um, we need to know, and, and I think we do at this stage have a fair idea of, of what's coming down the river in terms of climate change. In other words, what are we going to be faced with more in the future that we haven't been to date. And in this case, we're talking about up the river because I've highlighted their rising sea levels and more coastal of flooding. That's a huge problem with Cork City. Most of our flooding in Cork City happens to come from the sea as opposed to coming down the river. Uh, I won't labor this slide, but you'll see that there's a lot of the issues there we are experiencing in some small ways, maybe with heat waves at the moment, um, and in some larger ways, such as more frequent and destructive storms. And 
I can actually, you know, we can actually feel it here in the city. And I've worked a lot on, um, in a previous incarnation, with the flood assessment team and the severe weather assessment team. And there's more of this stuff happening now. This is just a couple of weeks ago. This is the South Mall, one of the major streets in Cork City, the second largest city in the country. And this wasn't actually it at its worst. Um, high tide was about that time, 0 8, 35 hours in the morning. It, it ground the city to a, you know, to a halt. And in Cork here, um, Brian Cassidy would know this and perhaps other people that work for Cork City Council are involved with Cork, but this is the crest, this is the motto, Crest of Cork City. And it's an early mission statement. Now, um, I'll show you what this Latin phrase means at the end of the talk, unless you want to Google it yourself in the meantime. But it's an early mission statement and really what we're continuing to do here and every local authority is to protect our cities and our counties. Here's another bit of Latin um, that actually means one for all and all for one. And what I'm increasingly looking at here are the advantages that a place like Cork City has. So it's hard to see in that slide, but let me just use the zoom function here. What we're trying to show in this particular um, slide is while well, Cork has got a lot of things going on in it. In other words, we've got County Hall, we've got City Hall, we've got major hospitals, we've got major third level, we have an airport, we have a dam, we have a shipping port, we have um, Musgrave wholesale food, um, food distributors, we have shopping, we have water uh, facilities, we've got a water treatment plant. Um, these are great things to have in the city, but when something goes wrong, it means that not alone does it affect the city, but it affects the county, it can affect the region, and it can affect the nation. So all of these things make us very vulnerable when climate change strikes. And people talk about the quadruple helix, and this is where we have the, the governments on the top right, you have research and education, you have business and you have the community all working together and working with each other, all these various strands, because a local authority cannot do climate action on its own. What we're looking at here, I've tried to highlight the research and education, which we're looking at here. We've got UCC in our area, for example, and the Munster Technological University, which is um, Trilly IT and, and CIT together. Um, we have people like the CARO, we have the Cork Chamber, there's our business, we have our, ourselves, Engineers Ireland. Um, we have the Public Participation Network, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. Uh, we have government bodies like the National Parks and Wildlife Service. These are all part of the strands of the quadruple helix. So you've got research and education, business and community. Now this slide is not exhaustive. There are many more people we could put on here. This particular photograph was taken uh, sometime in late February or early March 2018. And this was known as Storm Emma or the Beast from the East. This is City Hall in Cork um, taken around that time. We also use it as the front cover of our climate change adaptation strategy, which we have recently written like every local authority and had adopted and are now trying our very best to implement. Within that, like a lot of local authorities, we had a number of thematic areas, number of objectives, and we ended up with 66 actions which we are trying to implement as we speak. Just to sidetrack a little bit here, recently I was involved in um, an innovation seminar and this innovation wheel was shown up and I think it's a kind of a general one, not necessarily specific to the local authority sector. Uh, could be more specific to manufacturing industry or something like that. But what I've done is I've looked at the top sort of two bits of this uh, because the local authority doesn't work in every space. It only works 
perhaps better in some spaces. And I'm looking at this here from the point of view of networking and structure. So first of all, if we just talk about structure, that's sorting out our own structure as a local authority, our own talent, our own assets, and then working with or creating or strengthening networks in our area. So we're connecting here with people and with others to create value. I've just taken an example here. This is one of the 66 actions from our adaptation strategy. It happens to be action 13.5. Talks about ecological corridors and habitats and wetlands and uh, lands and biodiversity, etc. And what we try to do here is we try to look at our own sort of internal structure and decide who is going to run this. A particular directorate. We need a directorate to run this. So this is my directorate, Strategic and Economic Development. Um, we have council teams. We don't work on spended isolation. We've got community culture and placemaking, our roads people, our property department, and then the external partners. Now, just the only reason that the ones in red are actually in red is that I've kind of added them later. This document, I'd say, was started about 18 months ago, and our, our thinking and our, our way of looking at, the, at things has matured. So this is the dynamic document, and it should be that way, so that we can get as many people on board, many of the relevant people on board at the right time to help us deliver, not necessarily our actions, but the actions for our area. Here's a structure. This is a little structure in Cork City Council, and we can we can talk about it later. But just suffice to say that we have set up within our local authority, and a lot of local authorities are similar. We have set up a climate action committee. They're politicians. We have set up a climate action team. They're the executive. They're the staff within City Council, and I sit in there somewhere kind of in the middle in the climate action unit, helping uh, both of these talk to each other and work through the issues that were faced. And I think it's important at this stage that local authority are actually showing leadership. Um, it's all about a lot of people at this stage. I, I don't know if there's that many deniers left anymore, but we're now most people believe that climate change is real and there's something we need to do about it. What we need to do at this stage is kind of keep a focus on this, keep going in the right direction, maybe even look at some sort of a route map to this. Lest it be forgotten, climate change is going to cost. Let nobody kid you otherwise. And there are reactive costs in this. We won't go through it in great detail, but adapting, just very simply adapting coastal areas to rising sea levels. This is going to be a huge issue for all of our sister local authorities, Cork County, Kerry, Limerick, Clare, Waterford, etc. cetera. Um, even stuff like diseases spreading due to higher temperature. Now, this is not necessarily a COVID thing, but there's a lot of work looking at the malarial belts in the world actually extending from the tropics, uh, extending into the mid latitudes where we are, basically because temperature and climate are changing. Then we have the proactive costs. Now to do things so that we don't react necessarily all the time, but actually we, we proactively look at these things, it's important, according to Professor Stephen Kimbrough, that we have to convince people it's too expensive not to move forward. So I think it's a case of lead, follow, but whatever we do, don't get in the way. There's an organization called Climate Kick. Um, it's a European funded organization and, and they've done some research on what they call system innovation and they're calling this, uh, they're looking at climate uh, as a system innovation. So looking at this uh, and the definition um, for the delivery of desired societal functions, I just took a little look at some work they've done on sustainable mobility systems as an example of looking at the space where local authorities should or could or can work best in. So this particular slide is talking about lower emission vehicles. And you can see down the bottom axis, you'll see incremental innovation in 
distributed or sorry, excuse me, disruptive innovation and the degree of change involved. And then on the on the left hand on the axis there is the level of change. So I would suggest that you know local authorities are not. I know we're not involved in manufacturing electric vehicles. We don't repair them, except of course the, the ones we have in our own fleet. Um, we're not involved in the material as you go up the diagram into the blue shaded lozenges. Um, we're not into integrated mobility systems. Where we work and where we can work to do something uh, like this innovation, we look at the pollution control regulations or maybe we're involved in drawing those up or maybe enforcing them. Congestion charges is a role that we can play. Bans on landfills is a role we have. Carbon pricing, not necessary. That may be a central government role. But my point here is that there are spaces that local authorities will not, do not, and will never work in. But we, there are areas where we can make a difference. And what we're trying to do here is create sort of a new culture or a new value um, amongst our citizens. Looking at another slightly related example, this is a car sharing model. So you've, you've seen some of these in the streets, go cars, etc. cetera. Um, again, we're not down in the bottom of this diagram. We're more in the middle and towards the, the upper end of it. Higher car tax, central government. Carbon pricing, central government. Parking restrictions for private cars, that's us, that's kind of us. Higher congestion charges, that could be us or central government. Dedicated parking spaces, yeah, we're there. So there are, there's, a, there's a place for us helping drive this. And, and I think the car sharing model, what they're talking about here is that the, the culture and values at the very end of this should be the convenience for people to hire, use a car when they need to without the money and, and you know, it's sitting outside. But that eventually people may value the access to a car above the ownership of a car. And looking at the research and looking at the sort of work done in this area, uh, I won't read through this entire slide, but what I'm trying to pick out from it is the fact that we're talking about collaboration. We're talking about generating an innovation movement. And people talk about creating an enabling environment or an innovation space or a collaborative ecosystem. Is this a major role for local authorities? Now, with regards to network, which I mentioned earlier on at the top of that um, innovation wheel, there's already a network that exists in all local authorities since 2015. It's called the Public Participation Network. And this is something that allows us as a local authority to connect with community groups in our area. It helps to give citizens a greater say in decisions that we make at a local level and thus strengthening democracy. The PPN, again, we're talking about making connections with others to create value, our role in this, the Cork City Council or, or local authorities in general. But just very quickly, uh, public uh, PPNs are comprised of three pillar groups, shall we say. There are community groups in Cork City. There are 94 voluntary groups as part of this. There's an environment pillar. We have 10 local organizations as part of this. And there are social inclusion groups. And there are 81 groups as part of this. Now, that's a lot of groups. And just to hone in a little bit on the environment groups, these are the ones that are to date, or the last time I looked at their website, are the ones that are involved in Cork. So again, a lot of what local authorities do, or in fact, what they shouldn't do, is reinvent the wheel. If there are networks out there already, if there are organizations, if there are structures, if there are people delivering things, we should not be trying to um, copy them. We should be trying to work with them and maybe in some cases provide a sort of an overall umbrella group for them to work under or to go back to that idea of uh, creating an, an, an ecosystem for them to work within. Now, just to go back some time back there, I talked about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and one of the 
17 goals that a lot of people overlook is number 17, and that's called Partnerships for the Goals. And this is strengthening the means of implementation and revitalizing the global partnership for sustainable development. What I look at this is how can we in Cork City Council use the skills and the strengths and the connections and the history that we have to make sure that we strengthen we either start up ones that don't exist or we strengthen existing partnerships to help us deliver our goals. Now, you'll be glad to know, um, I put this up again, because this is where I think it all ties back in again. It ties back into the quadruple helix about all four of the major actors working together in any local authority to help deliver something as serious, as all encompassing, as expensive, as complicated as climate change. This, just to give you a heads up, this is about the second last slide, third last slide, so this, there's not long to go. Um, just giving you an idea, I've tried to um, make it a little bit uh, personal to Cork City Council here. So again, we've got in the top there, we've got the cities, the regions and the national governments. So again, just to go over the SDGs and the various strategies, programs and frameworks that we, that I, work to. Research and Innovation, the Munster Technological University, I think officially going to be launched on, in January 2021 with University College Cork. And uh, I've always um, uh, talked about a town and gown initiative whereby the universities actually use local authorities almost as test beds for some of the great work that they do, um, you know, whether it be in housing, whether it be in roads, whether it be in water, climate, uh, social inclusion, um, go on to business, Cork Chamber in this city are extremely proactive in terms of climate change, as are the Cork Business Association. And we even set up with our friends in Cork County Council a good number of years ago now, an energy cluster in Cork City called Energy Cork, which is, which is working very, very well at the moment. And then we go down to community, the last one here, the PPN, doesn't mean there aren't others out there, other networks, but the PPN is one that we as a local authority are going to you know, pay particular attention to, to help us deliver climate action. Again, going back to a source climate kick, we're talking about triggering a shift in the system. And if you look at the last couple of bullet points there, it's, it's very important. And again, going back to, to Greta, engaging a new generation of climate leaders. Um, I'm not that old, but um, there's a lot of younger people um, there who can really get involved in this because they really are the future. We need to instigate behavioral change. We need to build capacity. Uh, and we're talking really about capacity in people at this stage here, enable connections and collaborations and stimulating demand for climate friendly goods, products and services. This is um, a professor, John P. Holdren. He used to be Barack Obama senior advisor back in the day, a professor of um, policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Business. And this looks, uh, this actually works a lot better on video, but I couldn't organize that for today. But really what he's saying is that we have three choices. We can mitigate, we can adapt or we can suffer. And the more we do of one, the less we have of the other. And it's just a question of what the mix is gonna be. And certainly there's a, there's a thing in, in, in child psychology called delayed gratification. Um, I think adults and delayed gratification, that's a little bit like us in climate action. We're thinking, yeah, yeah, climate action is really important, but not just now or, you know, I still want to drive my car, I still need to do this, I still need to do the other. We need to look at this and decide how much we're going to mitigate, will depend then on how much we have to adapt, and will depend at the end of the day on how much suffering that um, we suffer. A safe harbour for ships, that's the kind of Latin quotation, statio bene fide carinus, which is the motto of Cork. 
Again, this is our core job in a local authority, our raison d'etre. Our job here is to keep ourselves, our citizens, our city, our county as safe as we possibly can. And uh, just a little um, cartoon to finish off. Um, not entirely sure where this is going to be. Everest, I presume. Oh, yeah, sorry, it is Mount Everest, the Climate Change Summit 2040. I hope it doesn't get to that. But it just gives you an idea that we've, you know, we've done a lot of talking and possibly need to do a lot of acting now at this stage. So if I could just leave you with the last slide, I would suggest that it's, um, there's one key question and three key takeaways. There's a famous former East German rowing coach who got involved in the, um, in the UK rowing scene. And his great mantra, or his great question was, to all of the rowers, including people who had, you know, multiple gold medals, was that whatever they do to summarize your effort for every event, for every training session, everything you did or everything these rowers did, does it make the boat go faster? And I would suggest that local authorities are swinging around to that, that everything we do, everything we look at, everything we plan, does it help either mitigate climate change or adapt to climate change? And then the three key takeaways I would suggest are create and our strengthen the ecosystem and i'm talking about an ecosystem of partnership here as opposed to a biological ecosystem put the work into networks and encourage behavioral change sorry that wasn't the last slide here's the last slide what if it's all a big hoax there's a few deniers out there saying we're spending all this money and blah 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 and you know is it really worth it well it is if you look at the board it's worth it because we are creating a better planet for ourselves and for our children. Um, I, I don't think that uh, can be questioned. And this is my last slide, Goral Mila Mahagat. Thank you very much. And I'm going to stay online. Uh, we'll let uh, Ronan or Brian, Maureen run the questions and answers. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that it was informative. Cheers. Thank you very much, Michal. Uh, it, it certainly was very informative, uh, very, very interesting um, to see the important role that local authorities are playing. And I suppose as a local authority engineer myself, albeit for a, a competing uh, local authority, but I suppose what we often forget, and, and it's also very true of us that are, are working for local authorities, is that we are part of local government, we're part of local democracy. And there is a channel there for um, the citizens of our functional areas to make a difference through, through, through their, their, their local representatives um, and through their local authorities. So it's, it's very interesting to see the, that, that, that we are taking this role seriously. And um, if I may say so, your, 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 your colleagues in, in, in the county are, you know, trying to, 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 to do similar. Um, so, uh, I'll just point out, uh, um, I see there's a few questions coming in, uh, folks. So down the bottom of the screen is a Q&A function. So if you'd like to ask uh, Michal some questions, uh, by all means, uh, use, use the Q&A function. Um, so I might start off there, one from John Leahy. Uh, Given that most climate change problems are generated abroad, is there a limit to how, as to how successful we would be given that we generate less than 1% of global, global warming? Um, yes, thank you very much for that. Yes, that's um, um, a, a, a sort of a question that I've heard before. Um, the problem is that um, carbon dioxide doesn't actually uh, recognize borders in any way, shape or form. And while we have a tiny population compared to the behemoths that are China, India, Indonesia, America, etc., um, we need to get our own house in order. Um, I'm absolutely convinced of that because I think that there will be a groundswell of countries like Ireland and the EU in particular, the, the countries of the, of the European Union, showing the way to the rest of the world that it can be done and that we actually will do it. So even though we make a very, very small contribution to um, global warming, 
I still believe that it, that doesn't let us off sitting back and continuing as normal. Very good. Um, so then we've a question here, uh, moving from fossil fuels, and you highlighted this in your slides, but how do you enhance the behavioral change in simple terms, I suppose? Yeah, and behavioral change, uh, of which I would not be um, anything close to an expert on, um, it's difficult. I mean, we can change behavior in a number of ways. Um, we can we can ask people very nicely. Uh, we can give good examples. We can show various reasons why we should do things. Or we and our others can um, start using the um, the taxation system uh, to do it. So really, it's a combination of both. Um, I do believe that we need to keep educating people as much as we can about this. Keep reaching out. Keep showing them. The advantages, um, things like grants always help. Things like um, you know, sort of tax rebates help. Um, there's also another way of doing it. You know, eventually you can actually squeeze something out of the system. When I when I worked in the UK, when they were developing the building energy ratings, it got to a stage where they made having a conventional boiler so bad for getting a rating in a property that the market almost went out of existence in a couple of years and everyone turned to condensing boilers. It was as simple as that. People could not make that bar, that target for energy ratings by using old technology. There was new technology. So it was a behavioral change. Um, so there's many, many different ways to do it. And it's something that local authorities need to, I think, educate themselves on to see the best way to do this. If I could come in there, Ronan, if I may. Sure, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Behaviour change is going to be front and centre into the future with regard to mitigation measures in terms of climate change, because mitigation is something we can all do, whether it's, it's slight change in our behaviour or what we spend our, our money on. And you will see the development of one-stop shops and in various formats, they'll be virtual and they'll be real, where people can come in and get good advice independently on what measures they can do within their, their uh, income bracket and what grants are available. And also they can save money by partnering with other um, other households and other other building owners. And this community approach is going to take off. Uh, I was intrigued there when Michal mentioned the public participation network, which was updated in 2015. Well, since 2015, sustainable energy communities have taken off, particularly here in Cork, there's a good number of sustainable en energy communities. Yeah. and. What, what, what they're trying to do is to target communities. So what they say is, who, who, who can, if you look at the, the Better Energy Community Grant Scheme, it's, it's, it's atypical of, of what we need, where we're, where we're heading. Groups like S S Sustainable Energy community case, Communities can target a community. They can say, look at, their, look at their income bracket, look at what they do, look what incentives are avail available to them, and then seek ways to motivate them through financial incentives like the grants that me, me all mentioned. Um, and also th these communities will be targeted through communications and digital platforms looks like the way this is going to be done. So it'll be done through the through websites, through uh, LinkedIn, through Snapchat, through TikTok, and other, other forms of communication that, that, are, that are out there. And if COVID-19 keeps going the way it's going, it looks like it will definitely be online communication <laughs> because we won't be able to meet up anywhere to get our our message across. So I, I think, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's going to be true that the sustainable en energy communities are going to be key to the future, particularly where, where households and, and buildings are concerned. Could, could I ask a, a kind of a follow-up question, uh, maybe slightly on, on a tangent, and I suppose Michal and, and, and Brian there have spoken about the collaborative approach, which obviously is a preferred approach, but uh, I suppose, I'm just thinking of the role of local authorities in the planning process. And I know, for example, the Cork City Council in commercial buildings um, look for mobility plans, for example, where they look for, um, you know, landlords or building owners to reduce the number of car parking spaces to provide plans for, you know, especially commercial buildings where you know, how do people actually get to work? Where are they living? How do they get to, to their place of work? Are there bus routes available? Is there, um, 
you know, is are there cycle routes? Is there showers at in in the building? Um, and I just wonder, I suppose, how much does that kind of, I suppose, more hard engineering, for want of a better way of putting it, how much does that need to play a role? And you know, obviously, carrot and stick, I suppose, you know, where where you have incentives for people to 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 change their behaviour, but also maybe you know. Um, uh, something more, uh, I suppose, direct to where they, they, they actually are forced to change their behaviour. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, we have, we moved slowly in, in ways as a nation uh, to this. And um, what I'm, I'm, I'm very keen on, um, you know, single use plastic and all that, um, we're going to have to do an awful lot more and buy keep cups to, um, to stave off um, the the effects of, of climate change, um, which are happening, and 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 as you know, uh, even if we were to stop tomorrow, there's a there's a lag effect in um, what has already been generated and is up in the atmosphere, and what will take time to um, to to uh, diminish. Um, you are right. I I think we are. I certainly know from my local authority because I'm in the planning. Uh, sorry, I'm in the um, Strategic and uh, Economic Directorate, uh, which has also got the function of the developing the new uh, city development plan. Now, the reason I'm in this, and it's just answering a question I saw there earlier, the reason that I'm here is that I was writing the climate adaptation strategy at the time that, and I don't know if this is going to upset you now, Ronan, but at the time that we had a boundary extension where we took a whole bunch of land Sorry, we um, we extended our boundary, and um, we also had an internal reorganisation our own in our own place here in Cork City. So, working closely with the planners that are involved in the city development plan, um, I'm very aware that they're taking, and I think all local authorities are taking the plans very seriously in terms of trying to build in something for the next five or six years, which will certainly not hurt us when it comes to climate change and should in many ways help us achieve that. So I think we I think we as local authorities are very, very aware of very aware of the influence and the and the opportunity we have to um, work with the whole climate agenda. But I think we're realistic enough to know that no matter like let's say Cork City Council, we have a, a really good new electric vehicle fleet, the largest in the country. But that is a drop in the ocean compared to all of the other vehicles, private vehicles that are in our administrative area. So there's only so much we can do, but whatever we're doing, we're doing the best I think that we can. That's fair enough. Um, I suppose a follow-up question to that, uh, and it's, it's kind of not just Cork City Council, but how do you think local authorities in general in Ireland are doing in, in terms of addressing climate action, um, you know, both in terms of their direct responsibilities and also, you know, uh, acting upon their own, uh, their, their own activities um, to mitigate climate change? I, I think they're doing, I think they're doing fairly well. Uh, I would suggest that over the last, over the last five years, I think we've really upped our game on this. I think we've become a lot more knowledgeable, everything from the sort of biodiversity side to the hard engineering side, uh, to the softer skill side of, of um, um, you know, of, of dealing with the public. Um, we're, we have to remember that we went through a period there uh, back in the last decade where we had, we lost a lot of staff. We had a moratorium. Uh, we had other fish to fry. I suppose it may have been just economic survival and um, I certainly know that we as a local authority can, can, can deliver a lot more. I would suggest that we need to be resourced more. Um, the CAROs have come into play. Um, and I know there are other actors in the, in the country, such as SEAI, the EPA, METERN, et cetera, that um, are, are playing vital roles as well. But if you want to get it down to the local level, if you want to make a difference to people in your local area, I would suggest that the um, local authorities near need to be uh, resourced a bit more. Okay, that's a fair comment. Um, 
so I'll, I'll just move on to the next question there. I, I think perhaps you've, you, you've partially answered this, but um, um, the attendee was wondering, are there any direct incentives as obviously these measures are going to come at a cost? Um, I suppose, I'm not sure, is, is that is that um, measures in terms of, of private citizens or, or um, the local authority itself, perhaps in yeah. terms of citizens? Yeah, I'm not sure. No, look, there are there are incentives uh, for people to to change their behaviour. I mean, they and and, and you know, the government generally tries to do and the local authorities the right thing. Um, there was 10, 15 years ago, we we believed that um, diesel instead of petrol was the right way to go in terms of uh, of um, private vehicles, and uh, we adjusted our taxation system to account for that. Uh, little did we know that maybe we weren't getting the whole story about um, diesel emissions and stuff like that. So, um, you know, we're allowed to change our mind when the facts change. And, um, you know, we keep learning new things all the time. So there are incentives, everything from, you know, um, SEAI providing grants and, and uh, European Union providing grants. But I don't think we're going to get it as people. We're just going to get it handed on a plate to us. Uh, that you must do this and there'll be a free electric car for everybody. Um, it's not going to happen that way. Uh, I do believe that um, if we go back to the, one of the slides that I showed there about mitigation, adaptation and suffering, and I'm not suggesting that we, you know, we're, we're suffering in a mental or a physical way, but that we may have to change our behaviours so that what may look like suffering is just in fact change, doing it doing without some of the stuff that we expect nowadays, whether that be fast fashion, whether it be fast food, um, etc. cetera. So um, there are incentives out there for people that want to change, but at the end of the day, we may have to change just to keep ahead of this climate, um, this climate crisis that we're, we're in at the moment. Okay, very good. Um, question there from Aoife Corcoran, uh, what stakeholder uh, what stakeholders are needed to be involved to make housing more sustainable, in your opinion? Well, I, I'm not entirely sure about uh, the question, as in, is it about the designers of houses? Is it about the people who make the materials? Is it about the, um, whether it's timber frame or masonry or six stories or two stories? I, I'm not entirely sure, but the simple answer is all, everybody. Everybody doing everything, involved with everybody, all of the time. That's just, that's just what it's about. And I know that Brian Cassidy, who I don't know if he's still on the call, yes. uh, Brian, Brian works uh, very heavily um, in our housing um, directorate in Cork City Council, especially with the deep energy retrofits of our social housing apartment blocks. And there's huge amount of work to be done there, huge. And, you know, uh, and that's just our social housing. Remember that there's an awful lot more non-social housing out there. Some of it built a long time ago, some have built in the recent future, but built badly, um, uh, that needs to be worked upon for us to come anywhere near some of the targets that have been set uh, by um, uh, national and international bodies that we need to reach. Yeah, so if, if I could just add there to what Hall is saying uh, there about, about housing, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a whole of industry approach starting with the building regulations Actually, actually, Brian, I, I, might, I might ask another question that ties in with that and, and, and leave you come in okay. then. Um, yeah. So Brian Harkin asked, uh, how big an impact does building materials have on carbon emissions? For example, concrete versus timber. Uh, what is the difference in carbon emissions? Um, so I think it's a, a kind of a partner question, maybe. Uh, you asking me that or me, Hall? Uh, I will, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Brian. <laughs> Yeah, well, on, I, to be honest, I, I don't know the difference between um, carbon or between timber and um, concrete, but you, you would suspect that timber would have to be less less carbon in, intensive, and it is actually a carbon sink, absorbing carbon as it's growing. So you'd have to say you'd have to say timber is better, but what the difference is, I don't know. It's I'd say it's quite quite large. Um, m materials are, are important, but with materials, there's always a consequence, whether it's fire versus um, inflammable versus inflammable materials, high carbon, low carbon, strength, and it's it's it, it's it's a combination of all those of all. It's a compromise of all those properties that has our you know gives us quality housing that's affordable that we, we can live in today. Um, 
But just go, just going back to how the, it's, it's, it's the whole industry needs to be involved from the professionals um, right down to the installers. And you see that the the whole industry is is getting um, more professional about, about what it does. And you see there's training courses now for building new houses to make them airtight. Even just 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 looking at the airtight in the side, there's a facility in in um, in it's in either Waterford or Wexford where where installers can go and get trained and learn how to ensure that their installation work is is airtight, just reducing the airflow, which reduces the drafts through the house, which reduces the energy consumption. So it is a whole of energy. And institutions like Engineers Ireland are, are, are very important because not only, you know, they, they provide an education platform for professionals and, and for professionals and also a platform for which they can share ideas and share concerns and make contributions to government policy. Um, and then you have the builders themselves, you have the Construction Industry Federation. They're, they're, they'd be very important because they're the people who will be offering training to the builders themselves. So it's, it's a whole of industry approach and people themselves then need to decide when they're looking at, particularly people who are designing, you know, what do people want in their home? Well, if you, if, if you want, um, if, if you want a, a high energy consumption home, well then you're, you're, you're kind of defeating the purpose of all the savings. It's like the people who buy the, the SUVs because they, they use less carbon than they did 10 years ago, but they're still SUVs, you know? So um, yeah, everybody's, everybody needs to, to row in from, from, the industry people to civil society. That's fair enough. Um, I suppose more, 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 more comment uh, there from Kieran O'Leary. Uh, he just said uh, EU studies have shown that for every million euro invested in green economy, it creates uh, between twelve and eighteen jobs, um, which is a high return on in investment in any sector. So it, it makes very good business sense, um, which on the face of it does seem to be to be logical. Um, I suppose um, two questions you, you had mentioned. Um, I suppose flooding as an issue in the city, and obviously it's 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 a, a hot topic at the moment. Um, so Mark Costo had asked, uh, how are cork checking uh, predicted uh, rising sea levels, and how are these being used within flood defence designs? I'm not sure that's possibly not. Well, I I, I have a stab at it. I wrote yeah. it. In fairness, um, cork. We obviously have uh, a number of gauges and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and we work very closely with our friends in the Cork Harbour commissioners and uh, our people in, um, in, in Cork County Council. But remember that most of the flood defence schemes are uh, run by the OPW, the Office of Public Works. And uh, they would be the, the, the leaders in this area in terms of predicting sea level rise. Now, the problem with that is that there is a slight rise, a yearly rise. I won't even throw out the figure, but it's in the very low millimeters that I think people can, can put their hand on their heart and say, yes, we're absolutely convinced of that. But there could be step changes. There could be some glacier will break off and melt fairly quickly, or there could be there could be some event like that, the change in the in the North Atlantic oscillation or the Gulf Stream, uh, which will cause sea level to rise quicker and higher than we're anticipating. Um, that is an OPW function, as I say, and what they're trying to do in Cork City Council with flood defences, uh, they've built what they think will, for the next 50, I think, or 60 years, into their design uh, to ensure that what they do will protect us for that period of time. You know, some people, like some of us, can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Not a mind in 50 or 60 years, like, but uh, it is an OPW, um, it is an OPW function that, but it's something that, and it's one of the bigger, if you're talking about an adaptation action, sort of mitigation is trying to stop uh, the stuff happening in the first place. In other words, turn off the light bulb. Uh, adaptation is stuff is happening and it's going to get worse. Um, we better get some flood defences going. The flood defences are costed in Cork City Council at 150 million euros. It's the largest flood defence uh, scheme ever in the country. So um, th there have been objections in court a few times and around the houses a few times. Uh, and, and that's the nature. Uh, you know, people are, are quite entitled to um, to object and to, to lay out their concerns. Uh, but it's from what I saw again there just a couple of weeks ago. Um, something is needed and it's needed fairly quickly. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um... I suppose there's somewhat similar question on a similar topic. Um, 
Uh, you mentioned that the sea is a major factor in cork flooding. In Fehard County Tipperary, we share an OPW proposed flood plan that is 100% engineered and 0% natural water retention methodology. Do you see a sea change ahead in old fashioned thinking? I'm not sure about the. Is that a pun? <laughs> Lucy Moore, very, very um, much so, sea yes. change. <laughs> Okay, um, Lucy, if I can, I'm, I'm trying to answer that. I mean, what we are doing in Cork City Council, again, with the OPW and with the consultants, um, we're looking at the flood events as being the, the sort of last, sort of the last stand, really. I mean, we are looking at, in as much as we can look at and influence what happens further up the river, whether that's working in conjunction with our friends in the ESB who control the dams that are upstream from us, and they have a certain function as in the, the dams have a function and the, the ESB have a function, have a remit in what they can do. Um, you know, looking at maybe, you know, sacrificial land, uh, floodplains, um, vegetation. So we are looking at all of those and we we'll continue to look at those. But sometimes a defence, a hard engineered defence is the only thing that's going to work. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, question here from John Lee. Um, in terms of energy independence, does the current current policy of stopping oil and gas licenses make sense, given that CARB will finish in the next few years? I suppose it's the flip side of, you know, um, being a small island state and you know um, having some independence from uh, yeah. from outside influences. Yeah, I can I can see that, and and, and that's um that's a topic actually for a, for a, for a whole other discussion. Whether it's um I just read in the paper today that um you know they're they're not sure what Biden's going to do about um fracking and and the sort of liquefied gas that the Americans are trying to sell over here. Or did I see that plus something about what was granted or not granted in the Shannon area um the other day or or today or whatever? Look, it's it's a it's a huge thing. Um, there is a school of thought that says we should just leave as much fossil fuels in the ground as possible, because if we keep looking at something like, oh, well, you know, um, gas is a kind of um, a transition fuel that will wean ourselves off the really, really bad stuff, which is turf, would you believe it, coal, um, crappy oil and things like that. But, you know, the, this transition fuel, it's gas, it's what it is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pumping CO2 out there. So do we continue that way or do we really put our energy into, and I don't mean that, that it is a slight pun, um, do we put our effort into uh, looking at all the wind, all the wind resource we have on land in this country that we have off land, either on fixed or on floating. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the paper recently about the what they call is it the Dublin Array, the big one that's in um, that they're proposing up there at the moment an offshore wind farm um, into solar, solar farms. The examiner did a two-page um, spread on that yesterday. Uh, biofuels, well, the stuff that um, our, our, our people in, in poor gosh networks are doing. So look, it's a, I have my own personal uh, view on it, um, which I'm not going to disclose right now. Uh, but, you know, we really have to think about, you know, weaning ourselves off something or maybe going cold turkey and i'm not sure what the real answer is okay um so look we might might just take one one one, one final question there um you mentioned that the way in which we farm animals is not sustainable and we should change the foods we eat i.e less meat having recently moved to ireland i'm surprised at the lack of enthusiasm for vegetarianism um are there do you know of any organizations that are actively changing this Caroline, no, is the, is the simple answer. Although we do have in, in Cork City Council, I know that we have a number of organizations that are looking at the whole food area and perhaps, and I'm not sure, I'll talk to the organizers in, in, in um, Engineers Ireland and if I can maybe send an answer to you tomorrow in some capacity. Uh, we have a Cork Good Food Policy Council and we have a, an initiative called Healthy Cities, which does a lot of stuff about air pollution and things like that, but also including food. And there's a big food uh, seminar, a European one coming up on the 1st and 2nd of December. So the easy answer is yes, 
um, we are becoming more aware of it. But I would suggest the country as a as a whole, and this is not um, this is not um, coming down on on Irish farmers. When we produce beef, my understanding is is that it's the it's the best sort of carbon beef, if you want to look at it that way. We produce the best quality beef for the lowest amount of carbon than perhaps any other country in the world. But the bottom line is we're still producing beef. Um, now, as regards food education in this country, I think it, it is, is coming along and a lot of people are understanding the linkages between the way we farm whether it be animal farming or vegetable farming, and what it does to the uh, to the environment. That's fair enough. Um, so look, um, well look, I might I might take one one, one more question. Um, uh, excellent presentation, Michal. In light of new Dunkettle interchange works taking place in Cork, can I please ask your views on sustainable transport solutions, cycling, bus corridors, etc., versus necessary infrastructure to alleviate traffic congestion? Uh, take Galway, for example, where there's a huge argument for the proposed outer city bypass, while other people and groups maintain that new bus corridors through the city will be more beneficial. Adrian, yes. Um... Ronan and Adrian, I could get killed here, <laughs> you know, by, 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 by giving an answer. Look, it really is a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, one of, the, one of the, the issues that sort of keeps coming up with me um, when, when I talk to people is they'll say, well, we'd use the bus or we'd use the sustainable transport when it's fully up and running and fully functional and absolutely perfect and streamlined and doesn't cost hardly anything. And I could charge my car, bike, whatever it is, anywhere I want at any time so that I'm never inconvenienced. Um, you know, I think we have to start incentivizing people. And you can, you can look at that word incentivize in, in a number of different ways. Um, incentivizing people to make that shift and make it fairly quickly. Again, there's a school of thought that, you know, you know like, like water finding its own level, um, if you build it, they will come. If you keep building a certain type of infrastructure that it will encourage um, vehicles. Now, is that a bad thing? If the vehicles are going to be electric vehicles in the main, including buses, which are powered by Irish solar farms and Irish wind farms on land attached to the seabed or floating wind or tidal power or wave power. Uh, I don't know if anyone's, you know, realizes that the interconnect that we have coming from France, what sort of power that's going to be coming from. I think a lot of us know that uh, the French mix is they generate an enormous amount of their electricity from nuclear power. Um, and that's again is another day's argument. But look, it's a difficult question to answer, and I I I don't have the 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 knowledge to answer it correctly. But we just have to look at when are we going to change. Does it have to be perfect and everything for people to change so that they're not inconvenienced in the in the least bit? Or are we going to have to do a little bit of suffering to get over this? Yeah. Um, I think it's a fair point. You do need early adopters to, you know, create that kind of peer pressure almost in, in, in some ways that, you know, uh, brings, brings around behavioural change. Um, we did have a couple more questions, but I think... They were kind of overlapping with, with, with previous answers. So we might we might wrap it up there. Um, I'd like to just thank Michal again for an excellent um, presentation. Um, we had, I think, 70 odd uh, attendees, which is uh, a quite a high number and indicates the interest in the, in the topic. Also, the number of uh, questions in the q and is, is a very good indicator of the interest levels uh, at a particular lecture. Um, so again, thank, thank you very much, Michal. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Brent Cassidy for organising the, the, the lecture. Um, uh, it was uh, a, a great initiative to bring forward. Um, so um, with that, I might just wrap up. Um, I, 